So I've scanned about 6,000 journal, I've scanned about 6,000 journal articles in the last 12 months and I'm going to share what I think are the 12 most interesting. Every week I scan about 37 high quality journals to try and pull out the kind of four or five most interesting to share with evidence snacks subscribers. And these are the 12 which I think are most surprising, most counterintuitive or kind of filled in a gap for me in terms of evidence informed teaching. Um, hopefully they're going to be useful. If not, it's a good reminder for me because otherwise I'll just forget all of this stuff. So this first is a working paper which looked at where students took exams and how that impacted on their performance. And they basically tracked millions of students in China and what they found was that for those students who were taking their tests outside of the kind of school environment or so, they ended up with a um, like 0.014 standard deviations lower than classmates and they ended up being less likely to kind of go to college. Um, I think they assumed that or kind of made the calculation that overall exam location accounts for about 8% of the observed performance between those students doing exams in school and those outside of school. And what they found was that it was the effect was even greater for students who did STEM subjects and uh, even worse where you travelled even further away from school. So there's like potential here for this to impact negatively on the kind of disadvantage gap. Um, now it was possible there was some kind of underlying third variable here but the, the kind of like causal design was pretty good and so I think the message here that is that if possible it's probably best to try and keep students doing exams on home ground and if not like make sure we take the time to get them comfortable in whatever kind of setting they're in. Talking about testing, this next study looked at teaching to the test and its impact on intrinsic motivation. They followed around about 2,000 students moving from year 11 into year 12 and looked at how much lessons spent on exam preparation and what students felt about their subjects. And what they found was that exam, as exam prep, prep, as exam prep ramped up, um, students' interest and sense of the subject matter went up too. Now, this was based on student self-report, so it didn't actually measure exam achievements. So we've got to be careful about that. But overall, I'd say uh, we probably need to worry less about teaching to the test than perhaps we previously did. It might actually end up boosting intrinsic uh, motivation and attitudes towards learning. These next couple of studies looked at our ability to judge motivation and well-being more generally. And essentially, like what they find, which is in line with stuff that we've come across before, as teachers, although we're you know, good at lots of stuff, we're not massively great at judging student motivation levels or well-being levels. So these two studies had kind of similar findings. Basically what they found was that unless there are really strong clues available to us to judge accurately, we tend to be quite off and we tend to sometimes fall back on things like uh, student gender, previous exam results, other kind of like stereotypes that we have in mind. Now this motivation study was done um, on vignettes rather than actual classroom settings but all in all it's probably best that we are sceptical of our gut instincts when it comes to you know, judging student motivation and well-being and try to assume less and assess more. Now these next couple of studies um, suggest that even if we could judge well-being well effectively um, we still don't have a kind of like strong causal evidence base to help guide us in terms of what we should be doing about it. So a large review published earlier this year uh, in the US basically found that although the amount of kind of spending and attention on mental health interventions is kind of going up pretty significantly, that the efficacy of the different in interventions and different things we're doing doesn't always have a like significantly positive impact. Um, and this was kind of like, you know, reinforced by a study commissioned by the DFE earlier on this year, which looked at two um, like Quite, a, quite large mental health interventions across over 150 schools and over 12,000 students and what they found was that you know after one year there wasn't a massive boost to mental health in fact for some students they ended up reporting feeling even worse a uh, finding which you know has been supported by other kind of mental health research over the last few years and so all in all we just need to be really careful not to kind of jump too early to diagnosis especially if it involves taking students out of classrooms 
it's probably better that we focus our efforts on building high quality relationships and behaviour for learning within schools. And talking about uh, relationships, I really enjoyed this next study which looked at um, warm strict, okay, and essentially they like tried to identify some of the most effective teachers in a variety of schools uh, using case studies and they identified those teachers who had kind of warm strict approaches and what they you know found was that unsurprisingly those teachers who are continually warm and continually strict as in they don't lower their expectations end up building high levels of trust with students and uh, you know strong relationships now this was based on kind of written reports and so didn't actually take into account some of the um, kind of non-verbal aspects of classroom relationships but still I think there's increasing evidence I'd say to suggest that it's pretty powerful when we hold the line on working behaviour um, and are you know consistently giving our students demonstrations that we care that's both great for learning and for relationships and well-being probably okay <laughs> and uh, we probably have to be more over the top than we think is necessary. Uh, this next study looked at enthusiasm, teacher enthusiasm and like, student perceptions. They looked at uh, only 19 teachers, you know, 400 students or so, and they analysed classroom language and links to enthusiasm. And what they found though was that teachers who felt they were enthusiastic used more positive language, but students didn't always pick up on this. Um, our enthusiasm kind of dial as it were, reads much lower to us than it does to our students. Now, like I said, it was a small sample size and focused mostly on words rather than nonverbal cues, but um, in short, I suspect we probably need to kind of dial up our enthusiasm, be a little bit more OTT. Um, we need to like call out why what we're teaching is valuable, what success look like, looks like, and to celebrate things loud and proud, and uh, yeah, be more enthusiastic than we tend to think. And in terms of like acting, our way into a new way of thinking, it's probably good for students to do this too. This was a fab study which looked at student habits for attention. And um, this is like stuff that schools do when they institute uh, protocols like slant or star, which try to help students to like sit up, to uh, clasp their hands or fold their arms, to track the speaker and to nod their head to show that they're listening. And what this study found was that when there were a sufficient number of these kind of signals all bundled together that uh, students ended up, did be, they were more engaged as a result. Um, now, this wasn't done in a classroom, it was actually done in a virtual medical training context, so there needs to be some replication there. But um, I think we can kind of you know, begin to take the idea that it's probably best not to just leave it up to the students to figure out how to kind of behave in ways that help them. The more that we can kind of teach them how to behave and teach them how to attend, uh, the more likely that they're going to get good things out of school. These next couple of studies looked a little bit more at teacher professional development and the development of expertise. And this study, which was done in the UK, looked at the difference between schools which had a more open door culture versus those which had a more closed door culture. And basically what they found was that those schools where there were more kind of peer drop-ins, um, so just people showing up to each other's lessons to have a look, uh, ended up having quite significantly uh, increased student outcomes. Um, and we have like a kind of similar finding over in the US as well. Um, now this kind of finding from the UK was correlational, so there could well be some kind of other underlying variable. And in the US study, there was kind of like some incentives linked to performance management. So, you know, it was possibly distorted mechanisms going on here. However, when we kind of line all of this up with the previous evidence we've come across, it seems that when schools institute open door cultures, encourage peer drop-ins, where teachers are, you know, dropping in unannounced to observe each other's lessons, we see increases in student behaviour and learning, which, you know, really positive thing to, to get going with. And then the final study, which I think is probably my favourite, done by the TNTP, they looked at uh, like a load of schools in the US, I think there was like 28,000, and identified the top five uh, highest performing schools. I think it was those schools which helped their students to learn like 1.5 years worth of learning content in one year. They analysed these schools to try and figure out what they did differently. And essentially what they found was that these schools did a really good job on what they called coherence, or what I uh, have called alignment. And so when teachers, when multiple teachers within a school all kind of teach in the same way and are highly aligned in their curriculum, what they teach as well, we end up seeing like quite significant gains in, in student behaviour and student learning. 
Alignment seems to be this kind of secret sauce of school effectiveness. So those are the 12 most interesting papers, at least for me, from the last 12 months. If you're interested to know how I find and filter for research, check out last year's evidence review. It's got all of those details in there. And of course, if you're interested in keeping up to date with the evidence, then make sure you sign up to Evidence Snacks or if you want that extra edge, then Evidence Snacks Pro. So I hope that's been useful. If I missed out any cool papers, then do let me know in the comments. Otherwise, I'll see you next time.